Welcome back. Before we took the mandatory break, uh, we were talking to uh, Advocate Sultana Kamal about uh, the situation of women and how they are being treated in our country. And that is what was one of the factors that led her to study law. Wasn't that so? That's right. And, and how did, do you think that your study of law has helped uphold the rights of women in Bangladesh? Well, once you know the legal provisions that exist in your country and your constitution well, then you are in a much better position to really advise people that how mm. to really go about claiming and establishing their mm. rights. Mm -hmm. Mm. So that is how my studying law has helped me think through a lot of problems very logically mm -hmm. and practically. Because quite often what happens, we become very emotionally involved in people's problems. And then quite often we probably cannot advise them in a manner that that can be practically implemented in their mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. So studying law has helped me think through all these problems in a way that I can always see the practical implications of an advice. That how, what consequence this person will have to face if that person takes this particular step. Right. So that but is the law a has very been good there. way of The law has been there, the lawyers have been there and they have been advising, people have been knocking on their doors for advice and uh, there are many different aspects of law. One is procedural, the other one is substantial. Quite often substantial laws are not in favor of the disadvantaged and also the procedures are very complicated, very expensive, costly and time con consuming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why many people get discouraged to really go through all this process mm -hmm. and that's why we have all these legal aid organizations which are now trying to see that people's problems are dealt with in a different way and you must have heard about a system called ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, system. So we try to see that except for the criminal cases which are punishable offenses, right. people can actually resolve their cases in an informal situation. Is it like out of case? It, it's out of court, case, out, out of court processes and it depends on how well the persons can negotiate their rights mm -hmm. and of course as a human rights activist or a legal aid person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we try to see that the more disadvantaged person has an equal part to play in the whole negotiation process mm -hmm. that that person is not pushed aside or actually put in a disadvantaged mm -hmm. position where the negotiations are going on. Can you tell uh, you something about, uh, which is very intriguing, now people have forgotten, the Vietnamese boat people, you worked with them as part I of UNHCR. I did for some, some time, yes. yes. Can you tell us something about that? Well, uh, at that point of time, I was working with the uh, UNHCR, that is United Nations Human, Human High I'm Commission sorry, for Refugees. High Commission for Refugees. I think this ne part needs to be edited. Anyway, I, I was working with UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. So I was posted in Hong Kong and I was dealing with the problems with the Vietnamese boat people who were wanting refugee status in many different countries mm -hmm. and who claimed to have worked against the communists during yes. the Vietnam War. So I worked there for one year but then mm, because of my political affiliations and because of my, uh, what should I say, uh, loyalty to the Vietnamese war d you know, when we were students. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually it, create ki it created <coughs> kind of a conflict within myself and that's why I resigned from the uh, mm -hmm. organization and came back to Bangladesh. And also I felt that if I actually continue to work in a UN system, I won't be able to come out of that probably mm -hmm. after a few mm -hmm. years because mm -hmm. I'll get used to that system and then it becomes very difficult to really come and accept you, something. neither here nor there. Uh -huh. So that's why I just wanted to get away from that. When did you establish that? Well, the uh, organization was established in 1986, but at that time I wasn't there. I was not mm -hmm, in the mm -hmm. country or uh, there. It was established by nine very socially active and conscious personalities like Fazle Hassan Abed, Baister Salma Subhan, Dr. Hamid Hussain, Tahirun Nasa Abdullah, Baister Amirul Islam, Justice Subhan, mm -hmm. and Abdul Khalik, who was the then uh, uh, a lawyer and also the first uh, in inspector general of One police of Bangladesh. All the, all the legal eagles. All, all <laughs> the, yes, that's right. But then I joined Aino Shalish Kendro 
as a volunteer director in 1991. And then mm -hmm. I became the executive director in 2001. Mm -hmm. Is it like a legal aid, free legal aid? It's a legal aid? aid and human rights organization which provides basically legal aid to the disadvantaged or mm -hmm. disenfranchised, the, the way we can describe them. But then it is a, a huge or I would say a comprehensive program of providing training, doing legal advocacy, doing advocacy for legal reform. I, it has its own publication unit, it has its documentation unit, investigation unit. Then it also has gender and social justice program, human rights mm -hmm. awareness mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. psychosocial counseling. So it's it's a composite program which actually tries to provide people with not only information but then how that information can be implemented in their own life. But you have and a lot on your plate. How how do you deal? Well, uh, yes, we, I, I have my uh, very committed and competent colleagues to mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. help me in the organization and it has been established 25 years ago and it has learned and I, I, the way uh, we describe it that actually it grew organically. Mm -hmm. When it, we mm -hmm. started doing something we felt that it needs to be complemented by some other activity and then it needs to be complemented mm -hmm. by some other activity and then we did networking. We had many other volunteer lawyers, social workers, uh, human rights activists helping us. So it's not only an effort of the people who are engaged uh, particularly to this organization, but then uh, Aino Shalish Kendro has been able to engage uh, mm -hmm. many other people of the, uh, you know socially active and committed people to really come and help this organization. It, it, it funds state. itself. Uh, well, it cannot fund itself. We are dependent on foreign funding, but mm -hmm. then we also get a lot of local sponsorship. When you say you are dependent on foreign funding, then don't we have to toe the line of our foreign funders? We do. We do, but then Ayn Shalish Kendro has earned a position among the donor communities also where Ayn Shalish Kendro can say that this is the activity for which we are seeking foreign funding, but then we do not have to really allow our donor partners to, to tell really us what to do. tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you, were also, you are also involved with TIB and you are possibly the current chairman? I'm the current chairperson for TIB, that's yep. right. Uh, a lot of people, uh, what is it? I mean, is it part of uh, UN? Then it's refuted, no, it's not part of UN, but it's international. It's an international organization whose headquarters is in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And it's an international movement, we would say, to curb uh, corruption mm -hmm. in member countries. And Bangladesh is one of the member uh, members of this international organization. And a, may, may I say prominent member? Prominent <laughs> member. Bangladesh actually has been able to establish certain models for other chapters to follow. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it, it is really a very significant chapter. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you prepare this uh, league table, this list of uh, the most corrupted countries or the least corrupted countries, what are the considerations? Well, there are certain points that need to be considered and probably one thing needs to be made clear here that whenever they are actually assessing Bangladesh or this particular team is assessing Bangladesh, no Bangladeshi will be in that team. Right. So it will be done by people who are not Bangladeshis but members of or appointed people of TI, that is tra Transparency International. And they actually look at certain indexes like the, uh, or, you know, development, th there are development indexes, there are certain economic indexes, social indexes, law and order situation, then uh, whether the democracy is firm enough to, or also uh, basically wh whether the uh, justice system is working well in that mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. But when the when the list is out, it's usually we find uh, Bangladesh featuring somewhere there. You see, and uh, everybody would say, "Oh, we have, we have not improved, or we have improved. We have gone by one notch up or one notch down." Uh, and is this because of the the publicized corruption, or is it because of the lack of democratic? One uh, of the person. reasons, one of the reasons is, of course, yes, that uh, now the media is so open and the media is so alert also. Mm -hmm. So people come to know of a lot of incidents that probably in the past we would not have the chance to really 
know of at all. But then the other thing is that uh, now people uh, of the member states also have become very conscious about mm -hmm. it and they themselves also come out with a lot of Im information when a survey is made people do come and tell all this uh, you know people that look this is what is happening in this country and mm -hmm. one notch up and one notch down is not all that you know cannot be assessed in black and white like that because quite often what happens that probably many other countries have become uh, more corrupt than Bangladesh so that's why Bangladesh goes one two three notches up mm -hmm. but then if other countries manage their corruption well then probably Bangladesh goes down in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that matter. So one of the basic considerations is that how well or how competently the uh, member country is being able to deal with corruption, right. whether impunity is lessening or people are being uh, held accountable mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. whatever corruption is being done mm -hmm. by them or mm -hmm. whatever corruption they are engaged you, you in. You as a lawyer, do you think that people are being held accountable with these very highly publicized corruption cases or, or incidents uh, in Bangladesh? I would probably not be shy in saying that one of the basic problems in Bangladesh is impunity mm -hmm. of people, not only in corruption but in any kind of crime people commit. If you have somehow or other any any kind of link with any kind of power social economic political cultural your crime is actually kind of overlooked or you are not bound to come and say or, or you know uh, kind of you know uh, what should i say that uh, answer for whatever uh, irregularity or corruption yeah. or Who? crime you are engaged How in. How many friends you have in high places? It all <laughs> depends on that, <laughs> yes. Or our brother, our our Anybody, yeah, anybody. <laughs> or you belong to a particular party or a particular group or you have your, uh, in Bangla we say mama, mama jor ache. Kutum, kutum bari. You became involved or rather you became part of the caretaker government. What is a caretaker government? I understand that uh, a caretaker is an inter interim system. You see, They take over from the outgoing, uh, they maintain law and order and uh, conduct a peaceful uh, 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 election and then they pass with, it on. Uh, they, they are interested with two particular tasks. One is that they will conduct the day-to-day -day activities of the ministry or uh, you know, lead the day-to-day -day activities of the ministry and the second responsibility is to see that the election commission is allowed to conduct the election freely and provide any kind of Supposing. cooperation needed by the election commission mm -hmm. that the government will have to uh, provide right. to the election commission. So, it has to be made very clear that it is not the government that conducts the election. It is the election commission. Uh, it is the election commission, but then people's uh, belief is that, that when there is a uh, caretaker government, probably the chances of the election commission being influenced by the government is less. Mm -hmm. So, they have more freedom to really uh, give the nation a free and fair election. Uh, we would like to go into detail about this caretaker government because this is, seems to be the stumbling block right now. But it's been there for some time, but right now between the two giant political parties, uh, 18 parties alliance and 14 mm -hmm. parties mm -hmm. alliance. Uh, but uh, we will have to take a break and uh, the mandatory break is I often say that it is uh, our bread and butter. And then when we come back, we will talk about uh, your role in, in the last uh, caretaker government and uh, three of others, uh, three of your colleagues, colleagues resigned. And uh, then uh, what happened is part of our very cultural and very colorful political history of Bangladesh. See. We'll come sure. back soon. Uh, so we take a break right now and uh, we just don't go away. We'll be back soon. Thank you. <laughs> 